Hi friends, uh, this is Grandmaster Ian Marcos for uh, the server ChessFriends.com. Uh, today I would like to show you one uh, one more game from the Tata Steel Chess tournament. It's from the seventh round and it will be a clash between uh, Sergei Karyakin from Ukraine playing white and Veselin Topalo uh, playing black from Bulgaria. Uh, this game is interesting from at least two aspects. First of all, uh, the opening, uh, the Grand Prix uh, attack variation against the Sicilian is is a very nice alternative to the um, open Sicilians. So I would like to show you a bit this opening. And secondly, I will, um, I will focus on one interesting question. Uh, the question is how uh, important is the um, the tactics in in a chess game. We will uh, see that tactics uh, plays an immensely important role, uh, and that usually the places in the game or the moments in the game where um, the the um, uh, points or half a points are shared between uh, both opponents, uh, the crucial points are mainly tactical. Uh, in in the uh, present chess, it's um, quite unlikely to see uh, one um, player win um, very smoothly strategically, at least at the at the highest level. So uh, this will be the second aspect we we'll, we will focus on. So let us see the opening. Uh, Sergei Karyakin played e4. To pass with c5. And now. Um, while uh, white played knight c3, d6, f4. So this is the Grand Prix attack. And what's the idea? Um, the idea basically is that white will avoid playing d2, d4. Will avoid playing d2, d4 and will keep the position opened uh, and is, is trying to get the, the bishop from f1 somewhere to c4 and to create together with these two pawns some attack on the king side. So uh, this leads um, in a way to a complicated battle where white has his chances on the king side. On the other hand, uh, white um, mm, abandons his play in the center, so uh, therefore black should be should be okay, should get some equal play. But the game is nevertheless very interesting. Uh, so black played something like g6, knight f3, bishop g7. And now the usual move is something like uh, bishop c4, but white gave a check, bishop b5. Uh, now if black plays something like knight c6, white always has this op option of exchanging on c6 and playing against uh, these two pawns. That means uh, this uh, this double pawn uh, restricts black um, mobility of his of his pawn chain a lot. So white gets free hand in the center, and uh, he also has two knights, which can uh, use some holes around these two pawns on c6 and c5, for example, the hold c4. So that's why it's uh, strategically safer maybe to play bishop d7 as Topalo did, and now White played a very uh, funny retreat, he played bishop c4. How can we understand this move? Basically, uh, White could have played bishop c4 immediately, and the only uh, difference is um, is based on the position of the, of the bishop, which is on d7 now. Well, and basically, uh, this has an advantage for black, of course. Uh, the bishop is developed a bit. Black can sometimes play rook 8c8 later on. What can be the disadvantage of, of the position of black's bishop on d7? Well, first of all, uh, the queen does not control d5. So it's more difficult for black to, to play e6 d5, which is very useful here. Uh, by the way, uh, that's that is also why uh, White uh, usually waits for Black d7 d6 before he plays Bishop c4 because uh, without the the move d7 d6, 
Black can play d7, d5 in, in, in a, uh, one move and get the tempo. And the second uh, maybe interesting uh, reason why the bishop on d7 is not so extremely well placed is that the bishop cannot get to b7 uh, very early. On b7 he, he would uh, support d5 as well. So basically uh, the the getting uh, of, of black's bishop to d7 helps white to uh, uh, to protect the position of the c4 before uh, of the c4 bishop because now the the d5 uh, counter attack is not so easily possible. Okay, so black played knight c6, white castled, and black played a very funny and good move. At the same time, he played knight a5. And this move is very interesting. Uh, basically, uh, if black plays something like e6, he can get the the, the f4, e f5 uh, break very soon, even if it would be connected with some sacrifice, and white would get good attacking chances, which are mainly based on the position of the c4 bishop. Therefore, uh, well, the the uh, interests of of the f1 rook and of the c4 bishops uh, uh, cross on the f7 square. So this this gives white quite dangerous attack. Also, we can add the knight, for example. Therefore, black plays knight a5 at this moment. Plays knight a5 and uh, tries to get the bishop away from the diagonal. On b3, uh, the bishop could easily be trapped. I think this this uh, line works quite well. Now after queen d4 which uh, attacks the, the rook on h8, I play queen b6 and I think black gets a piece. Therefore white has to play bishop e2. And now black plays normally knight f6. And uh, the entire point is that now after d3 the bishop the bishop is no longer on c4, but it's on, on e2 instead, where it is more passive. d3 was played, because white doesn't want to play d4, as, as, as I said before. Castling, and now white plays a very typical move, queen e1. So he tries to get the queen to the king side, which in combination with f5 and bishop h6 and knight g5 can give him a dangerous attack. Basically, all white pieces will will uh, try to get to to the opponent's king. Black uh, has to open the center as quickly as possible, or do something at the center, because the the center break is is a usual usually the best way how to how to uh, contradict um, to such a flank flank aggression. So black played knight c6, white queen h4, and black played knight d4 getting to the center. And now if white uh, s in a very uh, quite a silly way takes here, c takes d4 and plays some knight b1, uh, the position gets uh, opened at least partially in the center and black can immediately ta attack the, the c2 pawn. Therefore it's better for white to, to postpone the exchange on, on d4 a bit and he played bishop d uh, d1. So um, now bishop uh, covers the the c2 c2 pawn uh, safely, and uh, basically um, uh, substitutes queen in in uh, her job of protecting c2 point. Um, here I would like to. To show you one funny opening which Hikaru Nakamura uh, usually used, well not usually but sometimes used, he played uh, e4 c5, queen h5, maybe you have seen him to play this, maybe just to fa have fun, uh, doesn't give much uh, much advantage to white but nevertheless uh, he played it also against strong grandmasters and had quite a good result. And uh, in this position he played bishop e2 and after knight d4 he played bishop d1. So we have a very similar very similar um, pattern, although in a completely completely 
different position. Uh, we have this bishop d1, this queen h4, and this black knight on, on d4. Remembering such patterns and being able to uh, to see similarities in in different positions and uh, to remember them is a is a very good way how to improve your chess. So that's also why I'm showing this. Of course, it's a joke partially as well. Okay, let us return to the game. So white played bishop d1, and now black played rook c8, and. White still doesn't want to take on d4, so he tried to, to make some useful move and found the king h1 move. So the king retreats from this dangerous diag diagonal. And also sometimes maybe white wants to play something like rook g1 and g4. So king h1, black played b5. Trying to get some activity on the queen side. And now white took definitely. Or at last, let's let's say, and now uh, now it's important to decide where to put the c3 knight. Um, I think the the route uh, Karyakin has chosen is better than the knight e2 move, because from e2 the the knight would uh, would have problems to find some some good job because on on g3 it. Can, can't go anywhere, basically, so it would need to do something like this. And more, moreover, the d1 bishop is uh, cannot go away because of the e2 knight. So uh, white decided to retreat to the initial square of this knight, played knight b1, and from b1 uh, the knight has better possibilities, and the bishop can see outside. So white played knight b1, and black played rook c5, trying to get some activity on, on this along the c file. Uh, white played knight d2, and black played queen c7. And now uh, there was a game w between uh, Gashimo and Ceparino, which was played in at the European Championship in October 2011, where white played uh, knight f3. But uh, uh, this game was without moves king h1, king h1 and and b5. But nevertheless, uh, it, it is quite similar. But here, uh, Karyakin played knight b3, forcing black uh, to take on c2. Uh, Topalo is well known for his uh, love of um, uh, material imbalances and especially the uh, the exchange sacrifices. Uh, but here it's moreover, moreover uh, a must because uh, black doesn't have a light piece to attack c2. So uh, and as white protects it with white uh, with a light piece, it's very difficult for for black to get um, further without uh, sacrifice. So black took on c2, bishop takes c2, queen takes c2. And now. Uh, where is the black's um, compensation? Well, first of all, he has got a, a pawn, although it's a double pawn only. Uh, secondly, he's got two bishops, a bishop pair. Uh, and thirdly, uh, black uh, has these funny two pieces which uh, have a small problem to, to get to the game. Uh, Black's d7 bishop is especially uh, dangerous because it doesn't have an opponent. White doesn't have a, a, a light squared bishop anymore. So there's big danger that if these two pawns fall, the bishop would get immensely strong and against the, the king as well. So that's why uh, White modestly protected the d3 pawn because he cannot afford to uh, lose this structure. Black played rook c8, and white now played f5. Uh, he's got two more possibilities as well. One of them is to take on d4. But uh, now black uh, can reply with a um, combination. Knight takes d4, d takes d4, and bishop d takes d4. And now as this structure, which I said was very important, is then no more, uh, black can 
very efficiently get his second bishop to the center and dominate with the d4 and e4 bishop pair uh, the entire board and here black is cl clearly clearly stronger clearly better and the second possibility instead of f5 is bishop d2 which is sorry bishop d2 which is more modest uh, white gives uh, the b2 pawn but uh, at least uh, finishes his development. So rook c8, white played f5, and now black uh, played queen e2, uh, getting the queen uh, closer to the king side and also trying to disrupt white um, tries to to coordinate uh, as much as possible. Uh, now white played bishop g5 maybe safer as uh, the international master Shimacek from Czech Republic uh, um, said in his annotations it may be safer is something like bishop d2 and after rook c2 uh, white can force the queen back with rook a e1 and after queen h5 he can retreat to c1 and everything is covered so white feels white feels quite well quite safe here but uh, Karyakin felt like attacking, so he played bishop g5, queen takes b b2, rook a b1. This is a funny move as well, maybe not the best one. Uh, the idea of, of Karyakin is to get this knight on b3 somewhere into play, because here uh, he cannot like he cannot go to to d4, he cannot really go to c5, from a5 it cannot go anyway, uh, anywhere anyway, so uh, the only road is something like knight d2, knight d3, which costs a lot of time. So uh, the, car the, the Ukrainian's idea was to, to uh, get the queen away from protecting d4 pawn, now taking on d4, so that's what happened in the game. Uh, and now this, this knight from b3 where it couldn't go anywhere, uh, it's quite strong now on d4. But on the other hand, black got a very very easy plan which uh, is about running with two, these two pawns. And it's quite difficult to, to handle this. So maybe rook a b1 wasn't the best best idea. But anyway. Black played queen a4 uh, attacking the knight on d4. Uh, and uh, white, um, no, white played knight d2, getting the queen, uh, the, the knight even closer and closer to opponent's king. Rook c2 is a very logical move, and now white played queen f3 to protect the knight. And now this is a very interesting moment, very typical for Topalo's uh, approach to chess. I'm convinced that uh, most of um, Black's players from the top elite would play something like b4 and simply run with these two pawns as much as possible and this gives Black some advantage. Uh, but Topalo instead played a move which is extremely risky in my point of view and uh, extremely ambitious as well. He took on g5. I would say this is a mistake because uh, black had uh, quite uh, relatively safe uh, king's position and now he opens it voluntarily and there is a strategical um, rule which uh, which says that you don't have to open the position where your position is weaker on the flank where, where you are weaker and this is what what black does and I don't like it so much of course uh, white didn't retake he played knight g3 f takes e4 and Knight takes e4. And now black has to take, perhaps because after something like queen d4, trying to get the, the queen as, as close as possible, white would take on f6. And now taking with the queen isn't possible because of the check on a8, uh, with a transposition to some uh, one uh, endgame. Uh, so he has to take with the e-pawn and now look, the one's relatively safe king uh, is is pretty much unsafe here, and White's got all the 
heavy al artillery still on the board, so so this is not the way how to play it with black. So now after knight takes e4, black took on e4 as well. And this is a very important moment, as I said. Uh, one of the topics of of uh, on which I want to focus uh, showing this game is how important this is good calculation and good tactics. Because here why I decided not to take on f7. Uh, and got the bad position, and uh, I feel that this is simply um, must be the best move, and I am not really sure what what uh, uh, Karakin didn't see, or if he was over ambitious and wanted to win the game. But after Queen F7, King H8, and now Queen takes E7, it's only Black who is in danger, because now. Uh, rook f8, for example, with mate in 2 is threatening. S simply there are many pieces around opponent's king. So the only only move is knight f2. And after king g1, the only move again is knight h3 check. g takes h3 and now black is saved with a very interesting and uh, funny move again. He plays queen a2, and uh, the white king uh, is threatened along the second line. So, and also there are two checks with the bishops possible. So this is very dangerous. So white has to follow the repetition, uh, um, eternal check uh, with rook f8 check, take queen takes f8, and now black has the only move queen g8. And he's extremely lucky that bishop g6 is not possible because of the pin. So now white has to play something like queen f6, queen g7, queen d8, queen g8, queen f6. And the point I wanted to make at this moment is that uh, you might be a very good strategical player, but if you don't see that, for example, after queen g8 the bishop is pinned, or that... Uh, after queen f7, queen takes e7, you've got good chances, then it's very difficult for you to be a good player. Tactics is a is the basic. It's a basic predisposition of any chess player, uh, because if you lose a piece after playing a strategically brilliant game, it doesn't help you mm, that you are a strategical genius, genius at all. Uh, tactics uh, is, is so important as... Um, the ability to, to, I don't know, to multiply for a mathematician. You can have nice mathematical ideas, but if you cannot uh, do the basic calculation, you 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 are lost anyway. Well, so I don't know what what was Karakin's idea, but he took on e4, and now he's uh, three pawns down for the exchange. Uh, maybe he underestimated uh, this seemingly ugly move f6, after which black is safe on the king side and, and uh, can concentrate on uh, making use of his um, of his material advantage. White pair rook, rook a1, and uh, but anyway, this is black should be better, but this is a slippery, very slippery position again because there. Are, uh, there is plenty of open space in the center, the kings are relatively weak. Uh, all the heavy pieces are on the board except of one black rook. So much things have can happen and again this, this good cal calculation is extremely important. Uh, the best move here is rook c uh, queen c4 which wins more or less at once because after taking here black plays bishop g4. Now look how multifunctional this uh, queen on c4 is. It, it attacks on f1, it protects the c8 square against some check on uh, here, rook okay, check, and it also pr protects the f7 square so black can sometimes take on g5. So a lovely lovely uh, queen. Uh, white gave a check, or would give a check, king f7, queen f4. And now uh, the the main weakness is the e4 pawn. If this pawn falls, the the game is over, and Black can do this pawn fall. He plays queen e2, 
Oak G1 and Oak C4 and wins the pawn and is winning. Black is winning in such a position. Black played after Rook A1, Rook A2 instead, and there was a one repetition. Maybe opponents were short of time. Rook C1, Rook C2, Rook A1, and now Topalo has chosen a bit. Um, different approach, he played queen d4. So he felt that queen should be centralized, but he does it on the black squares, which are the dominion of this this uh, bishop. Instead of... Uh, uh, he should go queen c4 and keep the queen on white squares, which are uh, his blacks, because there is no bishop uh, on white side which would control it. So he played queen, uh, queen d4, bishop e3, Queen e5. So b black wants to capture the e4 point pawn and uh, concentrates the forces around him, but he didn't find out, and this is also based on, on very good calculation, that this is not real, that now white can protect the bishop. Uh, so white played bishop f4 to, to bully the, the queen once more, and the queen finally found the place on, on a white square. And now... Uh, Th there is a small smart move which Black didn't see. This queen g3. So again, calculation, pure calculation. I would say there is nothing uh, strategic wise you can tell about the queen g3 move. It's the only advantage of this move is that it works. So white play queen g3, and now Black. Uh, there is this threat of bishop h6. So uh, Black has to move his king. But king f8, and now white can take on a7, and after bishop c6, which was definitely the, the Topalov's plan, white has a nice blow, rook takes e7, after queen takes e7, bishop takes e d6, with a nasty pin, winning f for white, and after uh, king takes e7, white gets queen g7 with immense counterplay against the king. So uh, after rook takes a7, black had to change his plans and so he played b4 running with the with the bishop, uh, uh, sorry with the pawn. Uh, white attacked the pawn and again uh, after bishop c6 he takes on a7 uh, so black has to protect the, the pawn some, somehow else. But still, he lost the uh, a7 pawn, so the situation is not so clear uh, anymore. But here black blundered again. He played rook e2, which is a terrible move. Uh, again, uh, in a way fascinated with the e4 pawn. He tries to get it, uh, and uh, but cannot cannot do it somehow. Uh, because after queen f3, he, he cannot take on e4 with the rook, because he he would lose a piece. So after queen f3, he returned to c2. And uh, basically lost to Tempi. And the pawn again. So uh, white took rook b4. Black's problem in this position is that rook b2, which would protect the pawn, is losing to check, bishop e8 and queen h5, queen f7, queen takes h7, uh, with a uh, devastating attack on the king. So black has to play rook c2 to cover the c8 square. So white took on b4, and as you see, two small tactical tricks, both with the queen. Actually, it was queen f3, g3, and queen g3, f3 again. Uh, and white took both pawns. He took on, on uh, a7 and took on b4, and now it's of course only white who can win. It is the move 38, and um, I can imagine Topolo was quite depressed, so he tries uh, at least to get some endgame. He played queen g4, rook b7, he took on f3, and retreated with the bishop, bishop e8. And this is the end of the uh, uh, of the first time control, so now uh, Karyakin took a deep breath and could could uh, think for a while. Well, the thing is uh, that there is again tactics which helps him immensely. 
and uh, he can play rook c1 which he also played and now he gets uh, the exchange of the black's active rook because after some rook f2 or something uh, white can play rook c1 c7 rook takes f3 and maybe even rook takes e7 with with uh, or bishop takes d6 or something such and uh, he basically gives a mate to the to the king. So after rook c1, black has to take. White takes again. And now we are becoming to some uh, such technical fa phases, which is also important. But we have to to go uh, a bit quicker through it. Uh, we don't have so much time. Uh, basically, ideas are that black wants to. Um, keep uh, some kind of a fortress and white wants to break it so black basically stands on one place and white tries to get the the uh, to find the road inside of, of his open castle okay this is first interesting moment this f5 of the end game black decides to give a pawn in order to to destroy this mighty pawn door and hopes that in such a way he can he can better uh he can better uh, uh hold the position because uh after taking now these two pawns are much less mobile as if were they these two e4 f4 pawns so black gave a pawn and now he stands on one place again And white basically wants to to exchange the this bishop, which uh, nails or holds together the position. It holds all the roots, and also it's the one of the the bishop pair, the one bishop of the bishop pair. So it's good to exchange it anyway. So that was the exchange. But uh, on the other hand, black gets closer and closer to some very <laughs> very basic end game. Sorry. Uh, very basic end game in which he would hold because of the lack of, of winning material on, on the white side. King f6. So um, w now when the bishop wasn't on f6, uh, black can retake the f5 pawn because he gets, uh, gets there with a bishop. And white tries now to get inside. Uh, his idea here was to, to get via the king side because the bishop is no more here to cover the squares and black wants to avoid this scenario by getting his king to the king side but now he allows a small tactical trick f5 check king f6 king f4 and now black uh, has no move because uh, even d5 or h4 both this move would make uh, the pawn structure only weaker. So he decided to go back, king g7, rook b8, king f6, waiting again. White played uh, rook d8. And now black already has to do some, some uh, responsible decision. And he decided to, to exchange as much white pawns as possible. He played e6 or even e5 check, but white has to take anyway. And now taking with the king is definitely more stubborn. I don't think uh, black can hold this position because white will make uh, the bishop um, a target of attack and tri will try to get him out of this diagonal and uh, retake the h5 pawn. But after taking bishop takes e6, I think the idea was to get the bishop to some safer diagonal, maybe this one. Uh, Rook takes d6, now black is uh, lost for sure. Uh, you can check it with nullimo mode table bases, which are freely available on the internet, and I did it, and um, this, is, this is lost uh, even independently on, on, on uh, the fact who is, who is, uh, whose move is it. So black played h4, rook b6, h3. So now uh, his bishop is on the safer diagonal because the diagonal is longer than this one with the pawn on h5. 
but it doesn't help him anyway. Uh, now this is a very important um, uh, pattern, how to win such a position. Uh, the, the idea is to get the bishop out of this diagonal and get the h3 pawn. And how can you get the bishop of out of this diagonal? You have to take as much squares of this bishop as possible. So now white takes the e6 square and also the c8 square. Bishop g4, now he takes the uh, the g4 square. Now black cannot go to f5, he cannot go to e6 because of the check on c7. He cannot really go to c8, so the only only move is bishop d7. Now white plays rook c7, uh, because of the pin black has to uh, go with the king to the to, to a worse position, so he played king a8, and why white took even the d7 square from black's bishop. Now c8 is not ever viable, d7 is not a viable, e6 is not a viable, so we have only two more squares. So black played bishop g4, white gave a check. Now king d8, rook g7 is over because there is a double threat. So black has to play king f8. And now white attacks the bishop again. And now, how many squares does he have? Bishop f5 doesn't work because of rook f4. So this is not an, a viable square. e6 is not an, a viable square. This one is not a viable square. So the only square is c8. Now white play king c7 and now black has no squares. On any of them he would lose the bishop. So he has to, to abandon the long diagonal play bishop a6 and y now attacks the pawn and takes it. And now they played it for some more time but this is not uh, possible for black to hold such a position. The only thing white has to uh, take care is not to get his pawn on h6 too early. If pawn on h6 uh, and black king on uh, h8 it might be a draw. Even Even that is not sure. But you you know this is easily won. Basically, what White did is that he has cut the king from the h2 pawn, and now the h2 pawn will will freely run, and uh, White will get the bishop and mate opponent's uh, soul king uh, with his uh, his rook. So that was the game, uh, Karyakin Topalov. Uh, I think uh, the two things are interesting to remember. First of all, um, as an alternative to the open Sicilian, White has quite quite a few good possibilities how to play the close Sicilian, and the Grand Prix attack is um, especially uh, especially appropriate for club players, I would say, because it's dangerous. It's fun to play for White, and it leads to interesting positions. Uh, and the second thing, maybe more important, is that uh, even uh, on the s highest level there are plenty of tactical oversights and mistakes, and these tactical oversights are from 90% what decides the games, usually. As you can see, uh, there were at least three moments which are interesting uh, in this way. Uh, first of all, why didn't take on f7 here after move 27? which would secure him at least a draw. Then secondly, black almost winning uh, blundered, blundered this rook e7 trick. And then again here, after rook e2, he blundered queen f3. And that's why he lost both his pawns on the, on the queen side. So therefore, don't underestimate tactics. Try to uh, work on your tactics as hard as possible. Uh, from a short-term point of view, this is the easiest way how to how to uh, improve your chess. So this was Jan Marcos for ChessFriends.com. I hope to uh, get in touch with you at some other video. Bye bye.